Speaking of our Patreon, uh, I recently uploaded some new content to Patreon for our patrons, which was a new another lecture for my advanced data science class. Um, and this one is called the, what did I call it? The potential outcomes of data analysis, I think is what I called it. Anyway, I won't, you know, no spoilers, obviously, <laughs> because I know people are wanting to know. But if you do want to find out, you can sign up on our Patreon which is patreon.com slash NSS deviations. And you can see I've got now four lectures for my class and I think I got three more to go. So excellent. Yeah. Did you ever, did you, can we have a teaser for what the outcomes of data analysis are? The potential outcomes. Yeah. Potential outcomes. Is one of them like stomping away crying? <laughs> no, it's a little bit less down more down to earth <laughs> yeah <laughs> Wait, smaller I, scale i'm not that. sure how not down to earth that is <laughs> i mean that's not that's just every out that's the that's the outcome of every analysis right but, yeah but the, this is like the uh not aspirational but like let's put the professional mask on of like what the outcomes look like right yeah just for like a minute okay yeah <laughs> yeah so the idea here you know so for people who like are familiar with causal inference you know they know about this so-called potential outcomes framework um and uh the idea being that like when we observe things in the world there's like different potential outcomes that you could observe under like say different treatments or different whatevers and so there's i think this kind of, so the idea is like there's kind of a similar a way to think about that in data analysis even though we're not dealing with like the same kinds of like random processes it's just uh you know like if you use a regression model to like let's say estimate a coefficient so the output is the coefficient and so the this there's like but different outcomes that you could observe based on what can, either comes before the regression model or what data you have right but the the truth is you only have one data set right and and so you only get to kind of observe one outcome really right, right? and yeah. which is kind of like the fundamental issue with all causal inference right it's like you you only get one observation but you'd like to observe like different outcomes right but i think so the point is that like in but in data analysis it's useful to know like what are the other potential outcomes that you could observe and what would cause you to observe those things oh that's yeah, the idea like, yes so I, I have to admit this lecture did not come out the way i it didn't come out like I, if I were to do it again, I wouldn't do it the same. Um, it's just like I need to restructure it in some way. I don't exactly know what. If anyone has suggestions, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> but I mean, it, well, first I have to go to Patreon, become a patron, right, and then give you critical <laughs> feedback. Yeah, yeah. If uh, you want the opportunity to tell Roger that he was bad at something, exactly, and exactly why, yeah. <laughs> um, I welcome feedback, but uh, it's a yeah. pretty complex topic, though. Like I. I can see how that's not easy to just like quickly cover, you know. Yeah, I, I think I bit off more than I could chew. Uh, it actually got this lecture got split into two. I meant it to be one lecture, but it got split into two. Are you happy or mad when that happens? Oh, I'm happy. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it just seems like then you have to prepare one less. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> oh, I've got next lecture just already done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I still harbor so much guilt. It's, I was thinking about, you know, those things that just like pop up and you, you're like, oh, I still feel so bad about that. One time I was asked to sub for one of the huge um, like intro to biostat for public health people. Um, so it's like these like 600 people classes or whatever. Yeah. And um, it was a review before an exam. And the slide deck was, like, so long. It was like, hey, can you cover this? And it was a review of all the concepts up until the exam. And I only got through, like, half of it. And <laughs> I felt so bad. I was, and then in retrospect, I'm like, well, it was, like, a ton of content. And I was, like, pinch hitting. And, you know, so it's not like... <sighs> I shouldn't blame myself, but I still do. Like, a student <laughs> eventually raised their hand and was like, can we get to the last part? Because most of this we already know. You know, I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I don't know that you already knew that. First of all, that's not that's not true. Like, <laughs> they'll always say, we already know this stuff. Yeah, that's um, true. So I wouldn't beat yourself up over that. That's a good point. In another class I taught, they said that, and I was like, I don't believe you. Like, I don't. And then they didn't. I was like. There I you go. think you know that. Yeah. Well, I think, I, 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 to be fair to the students, I, I think it's not like an easy question to answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also, I think sometimes it's like they interpret it as like, have you seen this before? 
Yeah. And, yeah. and often the answer is yes, right? Right. But it's like, it doesn't mean that they fully understand it. So, I mean, I know in my head that the biggest error was like having someone just hand me like a huge slide deck and being like, go through this, you know? <laughs> and I was go. I mean, what I could have done differently is look and be like, here's how to pace myself to get through everything. But at the same time, like, then I would have had to be like, da, 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 da. you know, it's like, right. I would have. So it was structured poorly. But I still just like, oh, I'm still a terrible feeling. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you ever do you ever I feel like you might not ever get that. Well, no, I, I definitely have that feeling. Sometimes I just give a really bad lecture. and It's like, uh, well, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening. To, part of the reason I'm like, let me air this is because I was listening to another podcast, like the How Did This Get Made podcast. And um, one of the hosts, they're, they're talking about being an umpire in like Little League. And she was like, I made a bad call and it like still haunts me. <laughs> and I'm actually glad to finally have a public forum to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I felt so bad for her. She was like 12 years old and made a bad call and like everyone got mad at her, like all the parents, the coaches. And she said she basically like ran to the car afterwards to oh, like no. avoid being like <laughs> assaulted by everyone. <laughs> it's like and she was like, I even knew it was bad, but I didn't know how to undo it. Like my training did not prepare me. Anyway, so this is the spiral I've gone on based on you saying the lecture was too long. <laughs> well, I mean, there's different reasons why a lecture could be too long. Like if the lecture's long because like everyone's asking questions, sometimes that's bad, but usually it's good. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. If everyone's asking questions because they're like totally confused, then that's bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the other issue is like when a lecture is bad with like 10 students or how many students do you have? Not a lot. 15, right? 15, yeah. 15. Then it's like, okay, well, I can make it up to – when it's like your one shot with like – there's probably like 250 people oh, in the room. Oh, it's totally different, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like, sorry I let all of you down for your hardest class. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah, <laughs> Sure. Yes, please. <laughs> we can't we can't get too far into this without, of course, talking about Theranos. Mm-hmm. So this week, Elizabeth Holmes was found guilty on four of eleven charges in her fraud trial, and that's that. You know, I went back to look at, like to see like when was the first time we started talking about Theranos. Do you want to take a guess? Like, so we have this is we're currently recording episode one hundred forty nine. Which episode do you think? was the first episode we started talking about Theranos. Six. Whoa, that was close. Seven. <laughs> I knew it was the first year. It was almost exactly six years ago. Wow. January wow. 9th, 2016. I'm so glad. I did not look that up, but I formulated my answer while you were talking. So that's why <laughs> I sounded so confident. <laughs> I remember where I was when you started talking about it, which is part of why... You know when you have those, like, situational memories that are linked to, like, conversations or ideas? Okay. And I remember sitting in the Etsy office. Yeah, because you were not in California at that time. Yeah. I was, like, I was in at Etsy, but, like, at their San Francisco location. You were on it so early. How do you feel? How does this, how does this verdict feel to you? It feels exactly like every other success that I've had, which is that it feels horrible. <laughs> <laughs> It's well, like... also, it came so much later. Well, that's the nature know? of all yeah. success, I feel like. you know. Yeah, the satisfaction was like probably when the scandal started breaking right. for real. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel about – my understanding, and I'm sure you know more than me, is that she was essentially convicted for like defrauding investors and not convicted for defrauding the patients. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah. The patient part didn't, I guess – wasn't quite as convincing. I didn't follow the trial. I just, my mental capacity is so frayed at this point that I just like <laughs> couldn't follow the trial at all. You know, I, I, well, like it, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like easy to follow. Um, cause like, I, I don't know, maybe other, uh, it, well, it, I guess some trials are broadcast, right? 
OJ was. <laughs> yeah, so this was not, so you had to rely on media reports, and it was just a... Yeah, yeah. And it really was during the onslaught of, like, Omicron. Yeah, and, I mean, it was... Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's just like, oh, man, we're back down at the lower levels of the hierarchy of need, and, like... <laughs> Watching the train wreck of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos is like very high. That's like right. that's the type of thing you engage in when like your life is stable and secure. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I saw some other people talking about how they didn't care. Like it, it was just like I'm I can't care about this right now. Well, time has really passed. I think uh, so. That's I mean I think that's also the nature of these kinds of trials. They always happen far beyond. I know she talked about, like, domestic abuse and stuff, and that's the thing I'm surprised about is that I'm usually such a, like, sucker for watching, like, interpersonal drama, Mm -hmm. and I didn't even engage with that at all, in part because it's just, it's like a dark, that's just dark, I don't know, and unknowable from the outside, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pro- uh, yeah, a court trial is a very, very narrow window into anyone's life, you know. So, did anyone ever report if she was using the voice still? I, you know, I don't. I didn't see any reports on that. Like, I, I didn't. To be honest, I didn't look very hard, and it, it's not something they put into like the Wall Street Journal, but maybe in some other media outlets. I think, yeah, it's like this is too deep personal. Like, maybe they'll be because, like, what I found fascinating about that story is that, like con artists are fascinating you know it's like i know like in a perfect world it's like oh you like read the stories of uplifting people or people who live balanced happy lives and those should be your inspiration but like whatever i'm (laughs) like i am so fascinated with like these true crime stuff and like understanding (laughs) sociopaths right and like this couldn't have been like you said a worse window into that like it's yeah. It's just like, oh, I, I can't learn anything about her from this. And like it's such a mystery. Maybe she'll write a book. Maybe. From prison, you think? Sure. Well, yeah, well, I guess the question I, I wonder if she'll see jail time. I, I guess I'm, she'll probably will. But uh I assume because I think all the case all of them have like ten year prison sentence. Something like I that. Think. Yeah. Like yeah. max. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I saw something that was like she'll probably serve them concurrently. Yeah. Doesn't she have like a small baby? Yeah, I, 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 we don't know anything about it, but I, she had a baby. So, well, this could be the last time we talk about Theranos. Is all I'm saying, you know. I doubt it. <laughs> well, what there would be? Well, we might talk. The company is gone, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. So yeah. really, it's just we're just talking about Elizabeth Holmes now. But what if she writes like an autobiography? I'm definitely getting it. I'm getting that. Yeah. On day well, one. But do we talk about it here? <laughs> I feel like we shouldn't rule it out. We shouldn't rule it out. I agree. I, my prediction is we talk about it again. Okay. But, All right. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> but it is true. Like, um, I don't know. It The interesting statistical part is like long gone. And yes. I just... do wonder. I was, someone was asking, I saw a tweet where someone was like, what, um, like, what are examples of technologies where an early failure prevented it from moving forward and i still wonder with the blood testing if that's true that like it's less likely for a startup to form that's like rapid blood testing or this idea of like like daily medical intervent like not intervent observation i guess i don't know i don't know i think that just that technology needed more time to develop needs more time to develop I, i think I, if anyone ha- if anyone knows, I would be very interested in hearing if someone knows like, yeah, I'm in the field and like it's it has been you've seen a lack of interest because people want to stay away from it. Well, I think people might say that about electric cars. Um, oh, really? Because there was like, you know, long ago, um, pe- they were building electric cars. I don't know how long ago it was. Yes, yeah, maybe. And then like it just kind of died off. Not randomly. I mean, I think a variety of factors can you know we came to play but you know then there's this long period where there's nothing and then so but i would argue i don't know i don't know if that's like the technology was ready back then but no one was willing to do it i'm not sure the technology was ready but maybe it was yeah that's hard to believe yeah like battery capacity yeah i don't know yeah that's sort of interesting i actually with the covid testing 
I, there are products out there now where, like, there's this test called, like, Detect, and I think it's just one of many, where it does, like, kind of, like, PCR quality testing for COVID, where it's, like, a little machine, and you put a little, like, vial in, and it, like, like, (laughs) gives you results, and when I read an article about the founder of that, it's, it's almost like, who was that guy who did the Human Genome Project? Uh, Oh, Wait, the government one or the commercial no, one? No, the commercial one. Craig Venter? Yeah. It was like it was a guy like him who was kind of like an eccentric billionaire type. And he was like, I could see this. I want I want a world where you test yourself every day for like the flu or for a cold or like, you know, you're just like, Oh, let me do my morning like what sort of diseases do I have today? Right. <laughs> and it, it reminded me of Theranos. And I was like, I love this. I I love the idea of Theranos. Like, I thought that was awesome. You know, I didn't think about it very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know nothing about, like, blood. Right. So it's just like, it made sense that. Right. She was a good salesperson. And like. So with this, it's kind of, anyway, it just reminded me of like, oh, I think the appetite's still there for at least some consumers, myself included. Yeah. 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 I think the market probably exists, um, but probably the costs or, and the, and like, you know, the accuracy is a very difficult word to, to use in a context like this, but um, so something i don't know well there's a lot to discuss maybe we're so <laughs> maybe we will talk about this in the future <laughs> i know i know well another so another thing there was someone who um tweeted out like i asked her early days like if this stuff was bs like eric feigl ding i don't know how to, i can't remember his name but it was like one of the people who was talking a lot about COVID. And then he was like, oh, she got convicted. One time I called her out, which, and then there's a clip and he, it, he was exaggerating. <laughs> oh. But he did, add, he was basically like, I am not a specialist in this, but people in my lab are. And they say that there's like all of these problems that you could have with like venous versus capillary blood, whatever. And then watching her reply, first of all, the guy who was the moderator like totally undercut the question where he was like, oh yeah, the big debate between venous and capillary blood. And it was like, what? Like, it was weird. He was, it was like, he was like trying to like cut the tension of the question or something. Uh-huh. And it was like, what are you doing? Like, I don't know what the point of the talk was, but it seemed really weird. And then, um, and then she just depended, her response was basically like, yeah, that really matters. And all of our tests say that we're super, super accurate. And that's why we do all these tests and all this certification and blah, blah, blah. And it's so accurate. Like she never actually addressed. She's like, she said that chemistry. She was like, yeah, the chemistry, we've developed the chemistry such that the tests are accurate. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now it's, that's, that to me is what's fascinating. It's like, whoa, how did, how did she con everyone? Like, right. oh, that's one of the ways is like depend on this accuracy thing which i guess is why sad to show. I mean, there's there's probably the pause because it's like sigh this is why being the well actually statistician is a good idea <laughs> don't go there hillary being skeptical is that's value blah 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 <laughs> I, <laughs> can be used for good and it can be used for evil should we move to the world of sports whoa sure you ready for this the no. Financial Modeling World Cup. What? Have you heard of it? No. So I like I got I got deep into this a little bit, I have to admit. Um so it is a live streamed esports style event where people like use Microsoft Excel to compete in like a championship. For detect for for predicting what? Oh uh, well well, so there's like a prize. I think there's a prize. I don't remember how much it was, but you know, there's money. Um, and so I, they, this was like live streamed on like some Saturday morning. So I just like started oh, watching it. Oh, it happened. Happened already. Yeah. Let me just say this sounds horrible. This first reaction. My, my first reaction too, definitely. Yeah. So, so I, so I was like, I have to tune in. Yeah. <laughs> and basically, what they do is they have these like cases. I actually downloaded one of them. They're not like actual. Like they're not realistic cases; they're more like games, I would say. 
Um, and so they'll like they'll be like, here's a like a made up sport that has these rules and these constraints, and then and here and then and you have to take all this data and like and then basically like model the game, right? Uh, hmm. And so like you like, say, like it, simulate a game or like figure out the rules of the game. No, like... they give you the rules and you have to like simulate a game, kind of like oh, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, and they're all in Excel, right? Hmm. And um, so they're not like they're not actually doing any financial modeling, but it's like. The, I think the idea is that people who are good at Excel are from, from the financial modeling world. And so and they would do is they do like a head-to-head competition. So they'll have like two people who like start at a certain time, right? And I think they have a, like an hour to do it. I don't know how long, some fixed time. Um, and there's like different levels. And every time they advance to a new level, they have like they get points. And, but then <laughs> they have like two people who are like real-time commentators, all right, so I guess they have a view of like the screens that the players have that are you know so they have like a share screen going on so they can see what each person is doing, um, and then and they have like and this, these two people who are comment commentating I guess um, are like I guess Excel you know experts and they're like oh he just did like a formula this blah 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 you know like <laughs> and they like and they'll be like oh it'll, to go to the next round he definitely has to implement this macro like blah, you know, like and they'll talk about like here's how I would do it you know like no way it was for real yeah and i was like this is kind of interesting <laughs> i no, i have to watch this now <laughs> i didn't understand a word of what they were saying like it was like like i'm i mean i know a little bit about excel but like yeah that's not much though right so like because they're like effect- effectively programming in excel you know and so um but not in any way that you or i would recognize i think so it was uh I mean I didn't watch like the whole thing. It was really long. But like I was listening to, actually, I was listening it to it to it in the car because I had to like go somewhere. Um so so even though it was on YouTube, I was just listening to the audio and um just to get a sense of like what are these people doing? You know, and it was just it was kind of amazing actually. It was uh Who comes up with this? Like who <laughs> has that idea? And like makes it a reality. <laughs> I know, like someone who is truly dedicated to Excel. And then, like, actually, I got, like, I got into a little exchange with one of the people, one of, like, the commentator people on Twitter. Oh, really? Yeah. I can't remember his name now. It was a little while ago. But um, and he was like, you know, it's really hard to come up with these cases that are, like, that are, like, realistic in the sense that they're hard. Like, they, you have to use, like, all the functionality of Excel. Oh, I'm um, sure. You know? That sounds and it's very like, hard. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, that sounds super hard. Yeah. <laughs> so, um. I, the, for me, it was like I don't understand what the people are doing, uh, but the commentators, I think that was kind of like it was interesting just to hear them talk, be like, like, like a real like you know sports kind of thing, you know. That mu- I feel like this must be coming from like the gaming, like an evolution from the like Twitch gaming type stuff, where you have people observing video games. Like I can kind of see how this is an evolution from that. Well, I mean, and that is an evolution from, like, actual sports, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, because if I think of jumping straight from, like, poker, well, now I'm, now I'm like, hmm, I guess I could see that one, too. But, like, yeah, from real sports to this is, like, what is going on? But if you're kind of like, okay, sports, World Series poker, like, to that, or, like, oh, like, gaming I, I think gaming seems like the most obvious because you are watching something kind of technical. And so I, it still is a leap though, man. Yeah. It's that's so weird. Yeah. And, um, anyway, then, then of course, like people were, uh, Twitter were like, well, could you do this for R? And I think, uh, I mean, I think there's nothing stopping you. It's just, but like the issue is like, how do you come up with a scenario that's kind of, that feels competitive? It would be so much work. Yeah. and But it's also, like, solvable. Like, you know, it has to be, like, something that you can solve in a reasonable amount of time. And it's, like, in some sense competitive. I don't even know what that word means in this context. Yeah. I know. It's, like, did they, did they like, play each other? Where it's, like, who can, whose simulation can, like, create more points at the end? Yeah. Well, it was, like, it's, like, not, like, there's no interaction between the players, right? It's just I a see. single yeah. player type of thing. But they have to score as many points according to whatever the framework for scoring is wouldn't it be cool though if you both created something and then the like i mean i hate to but it's like you create ais and then the ais play each other i mean if you could do that in excel in the in the time period <laughs> allowed right i mean i could see like a very like 
you know, duct tape version happening where it's like, okay, I generate this value. Then we like paste that value to this other person's like Excel sheet. And then do, 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 what happens there <laughs> goes back. You know what I mean? Like I can see like a volley, a very slow volley happening. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Or you have two people like uh, programming in different sheets on Excel, and then you have them connect to each other. One thing I could see, like, maybe, like, if you did it in, I don't know if Excel can do this, but if, like, they could communicate via, like, a database. So if there were, like, a database Mm -hmm. that they they had to, like, push or results to or, like, get results from, you know, then you could have, like, you could use that as a mechanism for, like, kind of kind of competing with each other or you can definitely do that yeah that's yeah. i don't know i think you could do that in excel i just there's some probably you would, definitely can yeah yeah so and that would be pretty cool <laughs> see you're like into it now <laughs> i it just my maybe i'm just lazy but my mind cannot get over the fact that it would be so much work to to set this up and for like a very questionable payoff well i mean i think like any tournament you know that is organized there's money involved so like you know there's sponsors and etc you know yeah. so but like but you have to attract those sponsors like what sponsor would be like this sounds great sounds like you have a huge audience i can totally see how people love this well i mean that's that's all work right just like like just like everything else right i mean it's like cultivating new audiences it just, it seems like a massive gamble to be like, this will be popular. <laughs> well, they probably started small, right? I mean, the amount of work you'd have to do in order for it to even be viable versus the amount of uncertainty and, in my case, skepticism that this would be popular is like, <laughs> it feels off to me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think you can start small when it's such a complex thing. So, Microsoft is a sponsor. Okay. Lo- seems logical. Makes um, sense. There's yeah. a ten thousand dollar prize, not that which okay. is not that much money. I mean, yeah. Um, and then the AG Capital is a sponsor. I don't know. It must be some financial firm, right? Uh, I don't see any other sponsors on their website. I just mean I, when I say, is it worth it? Not for the players, like for the person organizing. For the organizers, yeah. Well, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. It must be worth it to some extent. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it, right? But. But is it just like a throw the spaghetti at the wall? Like I have to come up with three crazy ideas a year. It's like reality shows. It's a, li- a little bit like that. Yeah. 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 I was, I just listened to a podcast. It's, it's kind of heavy. So, you know, listener beware, but it was in the early 2000s. I want to say 2006. And it was a podcast. It was like a dating show podcast where it's like compete for Miriam um, and then it was like the end reveal was that Miriam was trans. Uh huh. And like it, like it was so early. Like trans awareness is not where it is today. And even yeah. I think if you did this today, like cut the because t- it was like all these bros, and then it and everyone had like a, like psychological breaks at the end of it and like they ended up suing and it was horrible and like it and it was also really popular anyway uh, in listening to this podcast which is like captivating and also like i said very kind of like like super sad <laughs> the um the it was a, a view into like with these reality shows they really are just like th- throwing ideas together to like see what sticks you know yeah yeah Especially back then when everything was new, like right after Survivor started and all that. And it was like, but anyway, it's, and then sometimes you end up with something totally wild. (laughs) Well, I think this feels like it comes out of nowhere because like we have no connection to this world, right? Like we don't do any, I don't do anything in Excel, right? And I think, I think if you, if this were your bread and butter, it would feel totally, maybe not totally, but it would feel more natural. Yeah. I, I can definitely see how like <laughs> this is terrible, but like finance bros. Like I can I can get the kind of like competitiveness of that field from what I understand. Yeah. And like what you see like in media, like about kind of like 
Well, and also there's like a whole industry. I mean, you got to imagine it's huge, right? Like all the people who are like the commentators were all like, you know, Excel trainers. They're like certified Excel instructors, you know, and it's like, you know, there's a whole industry there. So it's like there's a it's not like they're coming out of nowhere. So I think it's like comparing it to R is really not fair because R is just like minuscule compared to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like those little teeny like weirdos off yeah. to the side. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. I I am looking forward to watching this because that sounds that's so far from my experience. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. put a link in the show notes, and, and, you, and everyone is free to watch. I also wish I would love to know if it was popular. Like, did it work? Well, the uh, December 11th finals has 290 thousand views. What? Which is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's so many people yeah yeah where do they come from all well so you can see they have the leaderboard um for 2021 the number one person is in the united states number two india number three uk number four malaysia and number five the netherlands number six canada canada was it canada um <laughs> number seven austria number eight latvia they're all over right so that's that's amazing yeah the commentator, one of the commentators is from Australia, I think so. Um, was it all men? That, uh, that's all I... Uh, one of the commentators was a woman, but the, comp- the contestants The competitors. Was, yeah, they yeah. were all men. Of course. Oh, no, no, I take it back. No, I saw one that was... Uh, no, I saw... I think they were mostly men, but they were not all. Yeah. 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 I mean, just the what... Like, if you look at the rank, yeah. That's yeah. hilarious. That doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. That it's, like, mostly men competing. All right. Anyway, I wanted to bring that to your awareness because, like, it just blew my mind. No, that's. I'm very glad. Like, (laughs) it's like that's news you can use. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Do you want to give people some career advice? Yes, I'm. I'm ready. Are you probably? It's funny. We talked about doing this in the last episode, but we're like, let's not ruin the year. Yeah, yeah. We are. We we had to like dial it back last episode. Which I think was not apparent to other people, but we did kind of dial it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We also got at least one person who was like, I had to turn it off. It was so down. <laughs> Which is fine. I've got one here. It says, hi, Hillary and Roger, but really they mean Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This one's kind of long, so I'm trying to edit a little bit. So it says, I'm currently the only data person at my startup. And I'm trying to decide what I'd like my career to look like. The benefit of being the one and only data analyst is that they claim I can create my career in whichever direction I'd like to go. But I'm trying to think through what I'd like that path to look like. Uh, And so this person started off writing SQL queries, Tableau dashboards, and Alteryx workflows. Um, Do you know what an Alteryx workflow is? Mm -mm. Okay. I don't know either. (laughs) I This I'm going to Google. Alteryx? I'll, oh, Alteryx, computer software company. Okay. Wow, computer software company. That narrows it down. Um, From data to discoveries. Okay, anyway. That yeah. also narrows it down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me continue here. So it says, um, after a few years, I wanted to get more technical, so transferred to the internal data science team, where I was able to work on optimization algorithm built on a graph database. Love the work because I thought it was cutting edge and fun, but was sad that it seemed that many clients didn't actually continue to use the algorithms we built. That led me to pivot to my current role as a data analyst. I was excited because I got to be cross-functional. Currently, I serve every team, sales, finance, product, engineering, etc., uh, and influence our day-to-day decisions. My concern is just I feel like this role plateaus. Yeah. Um, in most of my conversations, it seems like the data analyst is a stepping stone to a data scientist, but I'm hesitant to go for a data science role because in my past experience, my work didn't necessarily drive business impact. I'd like to continue in a data heavy role that drives business impact, but I'm not sure what that looks like after senior data analyst. So let me see if I could summarize the, uh, this basic predicament here. You're a data scientist, you're building algorithms, but nobody used them. Yeah. You're a data analyst, you're like, you're kind of contributing to decision making which feels good, but there's nowhere to go. Yeah. Is that the gist of it? That was my understanding. And also the fact that this person does, it sounds like they do want to grow technically. Yes. Yeah. So that's important. Uh, <laughs> this one <laughs> feels like a hard one to me. <laughs> 
Well, I'm so I'm sitting here trying to scroll through. Um, so there's uh, the one of the founders, I think, of subs of uh, Mode Analytics, um, Ben Stansel, has a really good um, a really good blog post about like um, how careers in data science do hit this plateau. <laughs> okay, and it's like. Um, Essentially, like saying there, here's the different career paths, and they all suck. <laughs> that sounds a lot like our podcast. Yeah, like I said, no, that's why. I, so what I really liked about it is that I think because he works with Mode, and so he's seen has like a really broad understanding of like here's the different ways that places work. Um, he had like more concreteness around like this is exactly how it looks, and so what this person is facing. It, everyone's facing <laughs> so the answer is there's no solution so let's start there if we could back up for a second i think many people some people maybe not people who listen to this podcast but some people would be confused by the distinction between data science and data analysis data analyst right oh yeah so but um of, yeah but i mean i think but i think it, it seems like to me at least having never once worked in the industry ever <laughs> that the data scientists are like building basically building machine learning algorithms yeah un, like kind of unfortunately or fortunately however you want to think about it that is that seems to be an unspoken truth that is somewhat widely held and awkward when you have people who don't agree that that's widely held you know uh let me see if i understood what you just said so that that <laughs> so like <laughs> The idea being that there are people working in companies who don't agree that this is what data scientists do. Yeah, like you, there was, um, gosh, I can't remember. I think it was like Robert Chang had a blog post about like type A versus type B uh, data scientists where type A was analyzing and type B was building. Yeah. And so it's like, hey, here's ways to add value. Some of it is like analytical work. Some of it is building stuff and like, so that can be the understanding, but also there are people who don't value the analytical work at all and think it's like a small thing that type B people need to do from time to time. And so those people like kind of, in my experience, kind of turn up their nose at the type A, like the analytical work. And so when I'm saying it's awkward and I've been in this position where like, you're talking to people who think the only value in data science is like algorithms that scale productivity or whatever. Right. And are like, Oh, doing stuff in R isn't data science work, you know? Right. So anyway, that's to say, I think that it's a little snobby that it goes. Uh, so where it like gets frustrating is that there's such a prestige difference between, uh, the job title of data and like usually monetary difference in terms of salary between data analysts and data scientists that it like makes all the sense in the world to try to call yourself a data scientist. And so it's just, it's just ambiguity that leads to like all sorts of gatekeeping and people being snobby to each other and like people people's worldview about what's valuable coming out in like toxic ways. So anyway, yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> well, a previous episode, you, you suggested that people should ride the data science title as long as possible, right? Exactly. Yeah. Because it like often correlates with higher salary. <laughs> but the worst position to be in is be someone who's like really into analysis and then have people be like, wait, why aren't you building these algorithms? You know what I mean? Yes. I think, I think I do know what you mean, but it seems like that's what this person's situation is. Well, it sounds like that's what they want is to build more algorithms. No, no. I think the issue is that this person wants to like analyze data. Okay. Can you, can you reread it? It's, it's very long. <laughs> I can't reread the whole thing. Reread some, the, the middle section where the person started talking about like, because there was a line of like growing technically. Right. So this person starts off like building dashboards. Okay. Then after a few years, 
transferred to the internal data science team. Oh, so that already happened. That happened already. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then after spent, spending some time building optimization algorithms or whatever. Um, that weren't used. That weren't used. then Or used but abandoned maybe. Right. Yeah. And then, then uh, again changed to data analyst. And that's where this person currently is. Okay. Back to their original role? Or it like... doesn't sound like it. It sounds like it maybe okay. a third role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It th- doesn't sound like the news is good. Well, again, this is like exactly where everyone's plateauing in this way. And so the 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 Ben Stansel's blog has some really funny ways of putting it that I really enjoyed. But essentially, like you're either going to become like an executive, like if you become a chief data analyst, chief data officer, that is, um, you end up kind of plateauing there. You're never going to be the CEO, and you'll just like hop from company to company, being a VP of data. And, like, is that really fun? Like, who knows? <laughs> wow. And okay. then kind of says, like, a lot of people jump ship entirely. Some transition to other executive functions, which I can think of specific people I know who did that. Um, and then um, others left for data adjacent industries, most often venture capital. <laughs> um and many started their own companies, deciding that the only way to get a seat at the table was some, for them to create their own, which is like in some ways kind of what I'm doing right now. And then his solution is this idea of like potentially being an executive analyst where you're the person in the room helping with like, oh, wait, no, maybe this isn't. But essentially the idea of, like, you you need, like, the distinction we have between, like, a president and a CEO of, like, one's kind of, like, operational and the other's is, like, I guess I don't even really know what, like, a CEO does. <laughs> what are you talking about? You're the CEO of this podcast. I know, yeah. In that case, it just means I, like, show up and, like, say some stuff and then leave. That's I think that's what CEOs do. Yeah. So yeah. you need to be that person, except for you could come in and actually – so, like, essentially you need someone to manage the team and then you need someone who's, like, in the boardroom – saying like here's exactly what's going on i understand this deeply i understand the business deeply but i'm not like burdened with managing this team either right (laughs) which is super interesting and i was like that totally makes sense and i also think that like um i've seen people do both like my boss at etsy was both managing our team you know which like under her watch got like layers of management right so she was managing managers and then she also was like person number three on the ipo roadshow so it was like the ceo the like cfo and her on private jet like going from place to place like pitching etsy i don't even know what it is you're like pitching the business somehow i think yeah (laughs) yeah so you're like getting bank people to buy in so anyway in that sense she was functioning as this like um chief analyst rather than a you know whatever like the manager chief manager so anyway that won't happen though in this organization (laughs) well let me ask you let me ask you a side question that maybe you know the answer to is like, does this happen to software engineers? I assume it does, right? I mean, well, no, because I think so. I think the point that this person was making is that you can, you already have like CTOs and like chief architects and stuff. Like, I think the idea is that there, this is a little more accepted in other fields, but maybe not. I don't know. Now what's, a, what's a little bit more accepted? The, I know at Etsy, for example, there were, like, chief architects. Um, So there were people, like, super skilled who were technical leaders in a way that was different than the CTO. Okay. and that But that's, like, a software type of thing? Yeah. So it was, like, how are we going to totally rethink, like, should we be cloud-based or have our – that was just a decision that was made at Etsy after I left of, like – Everything was like we had our own like servers and everything. And then it was this big transition to like being cloud based. Mm -hmm. And so you could see like a chief like 
architect being the, you know, like a CTO shouldn't have the time to do that because they're managing an org, right? I, I'm, I'm like sitting here frantically trying to like skim this article to be like, what exactly <laughs> did he say? <laughs> If I'm totally wrong, I should follow up. But I do like the idea of like someone in an analytical position making decisions in a serious way. But now I'm hearing you where it's like, wait, but is this different than, like you said, how are CTOs? Oh, I guess what he was saying is that there there can be a CTO and a VP, but then the CTO usually is like the CEO versus the VP is like the president. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So like the VP is actually like running things operationally versus the CTO is like more of a chief architect type person. Anyway, there's ways that this happens <laughs> and there's ways that it could happen. But again, it's like, well, I don't know what's, what is ultimately the goal of work? <laughs> Well, just to, to hold on a second, I got to rein yeah. you in a little bit. Okay. It sounds like this company, I don't know what the future is. Cause it's like, if this person is the only data analyst there, th then like, it's going to be tough. I think. I think this person might be trying to become this like chief analytics officer. Which I, yeah. Which I think is probably possible, but they're going to be beating their own path through like the forest, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which is why I'm like, it won't happen. Right. I mean, it's going to be hard, right? Whereas you could go to another company where maybe some infrastructure like this is already there. Yeah. Yes. But no, I don't think it, I think if it exists, it's very casual. And that's kind of what this, what Ben was saying too, where it's like, well, I know I saw this at Etsy with Nell, who was my first boss, going on the road tour or the road show for the IPO. But I don't think that was like normal. I think that that was the CFO kind of took her under her wing and like recognized the potential and the talent and was like, we need you here. But it wasn't like codified in a title and she still had the managing duties. And I know for a fact, because I was on her team, that she like had to really scale back with like one-on-ones like she felt guilty she was like i don't have time for like one-on-ones right now and like i feel like i abandoned you guys but also <laughs> the cfo is asking me to go on a road show right you know it's like it didn't i don't think it worked it wasn't sustainable as what as is as was <laughs> <laughs> as it was <laughs> and now all those people are gone the ceo the cfo and now so <laughs> times have changed i have no clue what it's like now but um it's I mean, this is the this is the painful part of being in this new field, which we've talked about before, which is like, it's like, what are your good options? And like, what do you even want? Because it sounded like this person was at one point interested in learning more machine, like production machine learning, right? Uh, yeah. I yeah. Think so. And so, and didn't find it satisfying, but for reasons that sound like, management reasons to me like if you have a team that's working on stuff that doesn't get used like that's you're not doing a good job as like a manager <laughs> right and well i guess the question is to what extent does that experience generalize to like other you know is that always going to happen i think that is probably the majority of data science work <laughs> <laughs> that's a uh... It's Maybe not... I think that's probably improving, but I bet like five years ago, I bet it's been like slowly declining how much people are doing, like spinning their wheels on data stuff that's not getting used. But I think it's a function of the fact that the like people jumped on the bandwagon without understanding what was actually going to happen with it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it's like, oh, well, actually, this is like. We have no clue how to actually utilize this stuff. And we ran into issues and all of that. I mean, that stuff I feel like tends to go away when it, it's clear that it's not contributing to the bottom line. Right? Yeah. Eventually that'll fall apart. Yeah. Like you can't, that's not sustainable. <laughs> but you can ride that wave until it crashes, right? <laughs> yeah. Like go, like get that, you know, get the benefit of being highly paid, you know, and like being able to do whatever you want <laughs> right grab your surfboard ride the wave yeah yeah, yeah ride the wave yeah. and then sounds like this person now actually wants to have impact and that's where it gets hard <laughs> do you think it's like 
Oh, here, let me ask you this. Do you think it's a dangerous... How do I phrase this? I want to be careful with my words here. Do you think it's um, a good idea to be like, I want to be in a role that has impact? My view on this has changed. <laughs> okay. I feel like, to Ben's point of like exits from this field... I cannot do it again where I try to have influence over something that I don't own. You know what I mean? Right, right. Like, that's just hard for me. And it's it's so much struggle to join a big company and try to have influence. And the means by which you can get that aren't always this, like, they're not skill sets necessarily aligned with my values. <laughs> okay. Nor are they things that I'm necessarily that good at. And so, like... That's like, it's a values question because it's like, well, what's like, how many people, how many people that work in a big company, like passionately care about the product? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Probably not that many. How many products are there out there worth passionately caring about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, my, can I just say that my point was that like, I think it's a trap sometimes to be like, I want to work in a job that has impact because often the impact is like out of your control. It, okay. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Like if you care about impact, there are easier paths by which you can have impact than trying to like climb the corporate ladder. Oh yeah. Okay. If you care about that autonomy and that level of control, which I do. And like, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I, the people I feel like who succeed, that's not necessarily what's motivating them, you know? Right. They might say it's what's motivating them, but I'm not sure it actually is. Yeah, and I think it's like, it's also something that could be out of anyone's control. Like, it, you know, it, it, there are other factors that come down to like what impact your work has on whatever decision making is happening on. And I think, I mean, maybe in this situation, it sounds like maybe it's a small organization. And so like, this person has a voice that's like right at the table and like, and people are clearly making decisions based on whatever they're saying. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay, fine. That's, that's achievable. And at a smaller place, I think for sure. Yeah. It may or may not be codified with the job title and you may or may not be okay with that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, with the one time I saw this genuinely happen was not codified with a, a table, a, a job title. Right. And then, um, again, it's like, I mean, I think the point that Ben was making was that right now you kind of have like a junior seat at the table where you're like, like kind, kind of in the meeting, but ultimately you're not the one pulling the strings, you know? And I feel like I've seen that like at places that I've been at (laughs) (laughs) where it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. You're kind of there, but ultimately you're like really part of the tech org, even though you have the C-level title right and so anyway i don't know so uh think about this sounds so like trite but it's just like think about your motivations like (laughs) and also i i guess i would say like think about carefully like what work you really enjoy doing yeah like yeah i feel like people who are really happy like don't care about having control and just sit down at their computer or sit down at their job every day and like it and it's fun for them, you know? Yeah. 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 And, like, I know. <laughs> and, like, that's it. But even then, you, like, circumstances can change around you. Like, you can get a bad boss who comes in. They can do a reorg, et cetera, et cetera. For right? sure, yes. Yeah. And so then you have to be able to adapt to that quickly. Yeah. Luckily, things in academia never happen fast at all. <laughs> yeah, academia is the one place where, like, it's you're you're actually just like stuck in a situation, whether you like it or not. Yeah, I don't think there's a reorg in my future. But here's the question: What do people want climbing the corporate ladder? Period. Like, okay, we just talked about like you kind of max out as a data person right below where other people max out right like you're in the board meeting but you're not playing a big role there or like you're in like you you you're kind of like a junior member of the board right or of the in the board meeting okay for people who get to like the senior level or the ceo 
Like, what do they want? <laughs> I mean, you are asking. You could not be asking a more inappropriate, like, incorrect person. <laughs> <laughs> ultimately like what there's no it's a it's like an elevator to nowhere you know it's like okay i mean it is is it just money like no like it i don't know well i think maybe the general question is like what do people seek in le- in a leadership position in a, in like the corporate world i don't know um but i think a part of it is being able to like if i were to be i, I i've heard you know, in the academic world, a big part of it is being able to kind of like, you know, see people kind of grow and like it and kind of like be successful and ha- and to play some part of that, basically. Yeah, yeah. But do you think, okay, the people who set up like mega labs in academia or like mega groups, yeah. like I can definitely think of a few specific people okay. at Hopkins. Yeah. It's like... People who build out, like, or, like, the guy at Hopkins who's, like, the most scientist scientist of all time. Yeah. Whatever. Like, it's, like, what do they want? Because <laughs> <laughs> then it's not even about mentoring people exactly. Like, I don't get the sense that those people are, like, great mentors. Or, well, like... I don't know if I, well, maybe. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, I think that's still part of it. Like, I think, I, I, I think it's all over the map, I think. Um, and, uh and i i would suspect that some of these people don't necessarily want to have like a huge organization under them but like that's kind of the only way to to do what you want to do but it's not you could keep it small and like in academia you don't even get paid more to be bigger or maybe you do you well the problem is that like the way it works in academia is that if you want to get more money um to like do certain you know, like especially like in the life sciences, it can be very capital intensive. Like not in biostatistics, obviously, but um, and so you have to get these like the only you can't just get you can't just be like I need more money for my research, right? Like you have to get different types of grants, um, and like and and that just like incurs a lot of stuff, basically. But why do you want to do that? <laughs> Like, why aren't you, why, why not just be okay with like, yeah, I can't necessarily do the most cutting edge research, like, but I have a lab I like and like, yeah. Some people are definitely like that. Like, that's the classic, like, um, it's the like kind of Howard Hughes investigator model, right? So they just have their one lab and they got their continuous funding from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and they have a couple of postdocs, a couple of grad students, that's it, that's period, right? Um, Because there's no money, so, and they don't have to write grants. Right. Yeah. Yep. And so, and those are like all people working on like, you know, fruit flies. <laughs> whatever, right, right. Right. Yeah. And they're yeah. fine. You know? Actually, I had, I think I had one college professor who was not, was that like, what's that harbor or something? Like there's something harbor. Oh, uh, Bar Harbor. No, I can't remember what it is, but okay. it's like another one of these little like meccas. Oh, like... Cold Spring Harbor. Yes, that's it. Yeah. And so, anyway, he would kind of, like, fly back and, you know, teach his one class. And then... <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and the class was really hard. And it was the lowest grade I got in college, by far. Um, so, <laughs> the... Anyway, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, what? I don't know. I Sometimes I consider it a mistake to look through, look for growth from a job, even though psychologically I know I need it, you know? Mm-hmm. It, so it's like, can you have things you care about for growth outside of your job? Yeah. I see what you're saying here. Yeah, yeah. Like, why is it such a big deal to be like, oh, I got to the step before the biggest step in this company? Right. It, I get it. Like, because when I'm in the middle of it, I do always want to have more say and more, you know, like, I want more and more and more. But then when you zoom out, it's like, why the hell was I caring about that? Like. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so that's my, I would say, yeah, approach, like, consider nihilism <laughs> instead of what's the right job. That's the bottom line for every career advice segment. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I to go back to more practical advice, I don't think this is solved. <laughs> I think there's comfort in knowing that it's not solved. So, yeah, I think it's tough because like you're in an area that's like developing and it's like the the ground is shifting underneath your feet. So, yeah, it's exactly. hard to give hard advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Excellent. <laughs>
What was your lowest grade in college? It's, Dare you it's say? A C minus. <laughs> Ooh. That is, yeah. It was my last semester. <laughs> it was hard. That was hard. That was probably my lowest grade in my whole life. Like, I'm actually, I'm certain that that was my lowest grade. It was, in retrospect, it was insanity. This is the same as my bad lecture, where I still feel such shame, but I'm like, it, there is, I, I was in an impossible situation where it was my second semester. I'd already gotten to Hopkins. I had two senior theses to do. I was on the track team and this was like a third senior thesis to do. Right. Mm. So it's like in the, in the hierarchy of needs that like in, in the rank list of what to do, getting a good grade in that class was like absolutely last, you know? (laughs) And so I responded accordingly and it was nice that he didn't give me like a D. (laughs) Right. But at the same time, I think I lost out on, like, one of those, like, cum laude because of it. And, in fact, I literally, I think I was the first person below that mark. (laughs) Because I looked at the GPA you needed and the GPA I had, and it was, like, 0.01 difference. So it is my big academic shame, that class. But it's like a, it's like a, a, a test of, like, like, you call it in, like, Zen practice, a practice opportunity of, like, a difficult situation where you have to be like, can I like cultivate like understanding and forgiveness for myself (laughs) for the situation, which like if, if I was talking to someone else, I'd be like, that was an impossible situation that you should not have been in. Like they should not have allowed that to occur. Right. right? (laughs) Like I was literally flying back and forth that semester to like all the grad schools that I was considering. It was a, it was horrible. It was like a horrible time for anyway. Very stressful end of college. I recommend not doing that if you're a college student. I don't know how many college students we have listening to this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I would love to hear from other people who bit off a hilarious amount more than they could chew. Yeah. Their last their last semester. When they were already into grad school and experiencing senioritis. I was not that bad, uh, for sure. Um, It was bad, but not that bad. I didn't have three senior theses to write oh yeah yeah it was but you were you had the seat you hadn't bit off more than you can chew or you still had the senioritis i bit off more than i could chew like i also got i got a c my senior year too (laughs) oh good okay you held that back this is not the first conversation we've had today where i go on like a shame spiral and then you're like oh yeah but that's normal (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I got a. It was, but it was different. It was real analysis, though. So, ooh, yeah. that one would that one would hurt more. I think I was actually I was super proud. That class was so hard for yeah. me. Yeah, and um, my first analysis class was really hard too. And uh, I was like, this. I I felt like that was one of those classes where like the great of like the, I or I earned every inch of this C, and I, like I'm super proud of it. <laughs> Pomona actually did this thing where there was like an intro to analysis, and then real analysis after that, and that intro to analysis class was so brilliantly structured. Like it was, there was homework every day and the teacher was amazing. It was like one of my favorite classes I've ever taken. And I, it was like one of the rare classes in college where it was like, wow, this class was structured such that I met the maximum of like where I think I could have gotten. And like, Versus other classes, like, oh, I should have done the homework earlier. Like, you know, it was like, it was structured. and Yeah. That's exactly how I felt. Like, I like, as I was taking the class, I could, I could like separate myself from the class and be like, I can objectively see that this class is really well taught. And it's like, and it's an excellent class. And I'm not going to do any better than a C. Like, it's just like, (laughs) there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah. I guess we're saying the same thing, except for I like killed it. Got like a, like an A plus. (laughs) I think I might have gotten. I should go back and look, but I guess I'm just smarter than you. That's yeah, nice. I mean, I think we all <laughs> recognize analysis that. Analysis is hard. Yeah, analysis yeah. is. Then very I took hard. it two more times in grad school. So, really? Yeah, I didn't at all. <laughs> That's how much I loved it. That's how much I re- enjoyed it. Yeah, it. I love it. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think we can end on our discussion of analysis. That's uh, 